nations that forget God. Psalm 9, 15 to 17 says, The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made, in the net which they hid, their own foot is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, the expectation of the poor shall not perish. In 1 Samuel 8, the people of Israel ask Samuel to give them a king so they can be like the other nations. He was quite upset and went to prayer about it. God told him not to stress about it, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me. In chapter 12, Samuel addresses the people at Saul's coronation, and he reviews all the wonderful things that God had done in leading the children of Israel. Then he recounts, When they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the king of Moab. A few verses later, Samuel says, Take note, the Lord has set a king over you. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the command commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. Just as Samuel had prophesied in 2 Kings 17, it tells how after 200 years of existence, the ten northern tribes of Israel were conquered by Assyria and taken captive because of their sin. The scripture mentions high places and groves, which is a reference to pagan shrines and stone altars to Baal, the god of fertility. Baal worship included prostitution and even child sacrifices, which it says were wicked things that did provoke the Lord to anger. Later it mentions and they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, burning their children to death on the altars of pagan gods, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So it says, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah alone. And in fact, Judah was carried away to Babylon in chapter 24 because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon. In Psalm 106, David recounts, They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons, and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works, and played the harlot by their own deeds. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people, so that he abhorred his own inheritance. Yes, in Hebrews 10, 30 and 31, it says, The Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The great Roman Empire for several hundred years before and after the time of Christ existed, and then it fell. Ed Gibbons wrote in The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire that he saw five steps in the decline of the Roman Empire, an increase in divorce and remarriage, higher and higher taxes, building of gigantic weapons of warfare, a decay of religion, and a mad craze for pleasure. Sports became more and more and wilder and wilder, and the pursuit of sexual pleasure knew no bounds. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations 
that forget God. Nigeria is a wonderful country with great history. In fact, this is a picture. I believe it's Lagos Island. I lived there for a time. In fact, that's where I found uh, my wife. Didn't go there to look for a wife. That was a happy surprise from God. Thank you, Jesus. Nigeria is a wonderful country with great history, awesome people, blessed with abundant natural resources and plenty of good educational opportunities. But in Nigeria, we've seen the results of corruption out of control. I had a conversation with a Nigerian businessman who told me he would have paid his own money to have the roads in his neighborhood paved. But he was told that if he did, he'd have to also give the local government officials money on a regular basis because they get a kickback every time they hire someone to grade the roads. Another man of God who was the top pharmacist in Nigeria, Professor Charles Wambedi, who developed the medication that helped people with sickle cell anemia for many years and has developed drugs for HIV AIDS. I was privileged to stay in his home for a week in Abuja. Being the top pharmacist in Nigeria, he was on a first name basis with people in power. He told me of a time when he went to see the then current president of Nigeria and they were chatting. He was at that time the founder and president of a research and development firm that developed new drugs to deal with health problems in West Africa. The president asked him what he was working on right now. He explained his current project and the president asked him how much money it was going to take to finish that project and he told him, I don't remember the figure or exactly the time frame, but let's just say it was millions of Naira. Anyway, back then, it was a lot of money. The president said, let me talk to the treasurer and I will get them to cut you a check for the whole amount. He was so excited. He called his board together and excitedly showed them the check, thrilled that they were going to be able to finish the project and help more people soon. The board members basically with one voice said, that's great, but what will be the cut for each of us? Professor Wambebe told them, I've never done that and I'm not going to start now. He told me it crushed him when his board voted him out of the organization that he had founded so they could give themselves part of that large sum of money. He told the Lord how discouraged he was about this devastating turn of events and the Lord told him to just hold on. Within a few weeks, the World Health Organization contacted him and offered him a position that paid very well and that made him able to help more people than he had ever dreamed. Now, I'm not judging anyone, and I don't know if his statistics are correct or not, but Professor Wambebe told me that if only 1% of the people in Nigeria who claimed to be Christians actually lived like Jesus taught, then corruption would be wiped out and Nigeria would be turned around. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. So what about America? The pilgrims and Puritans came over to this side of the ocean to be able to worship God freely in the manner they saw fit. When time had passed, and in the minds of our founders it was time to separate from England and became, become our own country, the founders set forth a declaration of independence that states, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our Constitution indicates that government business should not be transacted on Sunday, as a Christian day of rest. And the first part of the First Amendment to the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion 
or pre prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And in George Washington's first inaugural address on April 30th, 1789, he said, My fervent supplications to that almighty being who rules over the universe. Many more references could be shown indicating that our founders intended our country to be a Christian nation and to be influenced by Christianity and godly men. So, what happened? Well, Romans 8, 5 tells us that they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Paul sadly tells us in 2 Timothy 4, 10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed. In Mark 7, 21 to 23, it says, From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. James 1, 14 and 15 says, Each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is why Proverbs 4, 23 tells us, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And Proverbs 27, 19 says, As water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. We see in Elisha's servant Gehazi the steps away from God when Naaman offered money as thanks for the cleansing of his leprosy. Gehazi yielded to his deceitful heart and thought that he wouldn't get caught. Then he delivered deceit by lying to Naaman. Then he decided to hide his sin, and finally he dishonors God, living the life of a leper. We don't find him repenting, and leprosy represents sin. As much as we might like to make nations into inhuman monoliths, they are not. Nations are made up of humans, and if humans have a heart problem, then in time, nations will follow a downward trajectory no matter how well they started out. John Wesley said, What one generation tolerates, the next generation will embrace. Michelle Malkin, a conservative commentator, said, What you permit, you promote. What you allow, you encourage. What you condone, you own. What you tolerate, you deserve. And in the 1700s, Edmund Burke, a member of the English Parliament, said, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. So Americans started acting all quote-unquote Christian and tolerating unacceptable things. In fact, in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, preachers used to tell their congregations that Hollywood was filthy, Christians should stay out of Hollywood, and that politics was too dirty, it wasn't the place for a Christian. So the thing that would soon be piped into nearly every home in America, TV, was co-opted by godless ideologues, and the government came to have less and less godly influence, till in 1962, the Supreme Court of the United States made a ruling that essentially took prayer out of public schools. Students can bow their heads and pray by themselves, but even that was under attack for many years. At the same time, there was the lawsuit by Madeleine Murray O'Hare, founder of American Atheists and her son that resulted in Bible reading being removed from public schools. 
Since preachers had been preaching for Christians to stay out of politics, there was no organized effort to fight against these moves, and O'Hare and her son were successful in their suit, and it cost them less than $20,000. Thankfully, her first son, William, the one involved in removing the Bible from public schools, eventually came to know Jesus as his Savior and as a minister of the gospel. Thank you, Jesus. In 1995, Madeline Murray O'Hare and her second son, Garth, and William's daughter, her granddaughter, were murdered by one of her employees. But what has been the effect of taking God out of public schools? The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. So what is the effect? We never used to have mass shootings. Numbers of times over the last 20 years when we've had a mass shooting at a school, I've seen memes that are depicting people crying out to God, saying, Where are you, God? Why is this happening? And in the meme, God will respond and say, you kicked me out of schools. Don't you remember? So let's see. Bible reading and prayer were banned from public schools in the early 60s, and the first mass shooting in a school I could find was in August 1966 in a university in California. Fifteen were killed. But this was before the effect of kicking God out of public schools had taken hold. Then it took 33 more years of no God in public schools till the next one, this time in a high school in Colorado, 15 dead. Six years later, 10 killed in a Minnesota high school in March of 2005. Then 33 dead at Virginia Tech in April 7th. Then 28 killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School December 12th. Then 10 in Oregon at a community college October 15th. Then November 17th, 6 killed in an elementary school in California. Then 17 at Parkland High School in Florida in February 28th, uh, fe February uh, of 18. February 18th, and 10 at a high school in Texas in May 2018. God, why is this happening? Where are you, God? Remember, you kicked me out of schools in the early 60s. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. What else has happened since our society started saying, God, we don't need you? Well, let's see. We've become a sex-saturated society. Sex is used to sell everything from cars to toothpaste. Sexual innuendos clutter most every TV program and movie, and explicit nudity and sensuality has found its way into the average home. Media researchers calculate that teenagers see approximately five hours of TV every day. This means that each year they see nearly 14,000 sexual encounters on television alone. We've had such quote-unquote progress. We've had the sexual revolution in America. We were well into the sexual revolution by 1980, but at that time only 18% of babies were born to unwed mothers. By 2007, that number had jumped to 40%. A reporter asked a popular entertainer about his adulterous affairs, and his answer was, Why can't I do as I please? It's my life, and I'm entitled to all the fun I want. We no longer have moral absolutes, and we're not accountable to anyone for our conduct. When I was a child, if I got in trouble in school, I was automatically in trouble when I got home. Now, if a child gets in trouble at school, 
His parent runs off to the school and challenges the authorities. Why did you punish my child? Government wants more and more input into the raising of children in America. An article in the New York Times dated May 12, 2016 says, the Obama administration is planning to issue a sweeping directive telling every public school district in the country to allow transgender students to use the bathrooms that match their identity. I guess we're now picking the gender we want to be. A letter to school districts signed by Justice and Education Department officials will describe what schools should do. It does not have the force of law, but it contains an implicit threat. Schools that do not abide by Obama administration's interpretation of the law could face lawsuits or a loss of federal aid. I hear that's coming back with the new administration. If you think that teenage boys won't use this to become peeping toms in the girls' bathroom, then you're naive. In Washington State, Todd Herman wrote an article, The Theft of Parental Rights in Washington State is Unconscionable and Immoral. He says, quoting a law passed in Democrat-controlled Washington State, originally designed to make sure girls could get secret abortions, insurance companies have been writing to parents informing them they no longer have any rights to be involved in crucial, life-altering decisions their kids want to make. Thanks to big government, Planned Parenthood, and Big Pharma, your kids will now get to use the insurance company's money and your premiums to secretly be put on drugs for depression or anxiety and you, the lowly parent, need not know that your kid might be stocking up on dangerous psychotropics. Your kid might choose to take the meds responsibly. responsibly. They might dangerously mix them with others or with alcohol. But again, you are only the stupid parent and you are not allowed to know about this unless your kid kindly tells you. Your hurting, depressed 13-year-old can now use your insurance to be told by so-called gender therapists in one single meeting that they are the opposite sex and that is why they are sad. So, with the sexual revolution and not wanting to be responsible for our actions or accountable to God, we had to take away the results of our godless, irresponsible life lifestyles. Today is the 48th anniversary of our Supreme Court making the murder of innocent babies legal in the United States. And in 48 years, we have slaughtered just about 62 million babies. This is the case called Roe v. Wade from January 1973. In 1969, 70% of Americans disapproved of premarital sex. But by 1973, this number had already dropped to 50%. Abortion advocates say that they are pro-choice. They say that a woman should be able to they say that a woman should be able to with, do with her body what she wants to do. Okay, fine, but we're not talking about what she does with her body. We're talking about what she's doing to another body that is inside of hers and that she's responsible for. We limit what people can do with their bodies all the time. Most states, now, you can't smoke in a public building. If you engage in prostitution, you can get arrested and go to jail, or at least get a fine. And you cannot murder another human, no matter what your reason. For years, pro-abortion people have tried to dehumanize the baby inside the womb. They have said it's just a fetus, or just a blob of tissue. DNA has all but silenced that argument. DNA is a molecule that contains the instructions an organism needs to develop, live, and reproduce. 
DNA is like a God-made microchip that has all the instructions your body will need to develop into you. It is the carrier of genetic information. At the moment when conception happens, well, let me just have a renowned professor of fundamental genetics say it. Dr. Jerome Lejeune says, each individual has a very neat beginning, the moment of conception. He goes on to say that as soon as the 23 paternal chromosomes and the 23 maternal chromosomes are united, personal constitution takes place. He's saying you become a person. There is nothing about coming out of the womb that confers personhood on the baby. To accept the fact that after fertilization has taken place, a new human being has come into being is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. The baby in the womb is a person, and pro-abortion medical professionals know this. In Genesis 4.1, Eve says, I've gotten a man with God's help. Genesis 21.1 says, God visited Sarah exactly as he said he would. God did to Sarah what he promised. Sarah became pregnant and gave Abraham a son. Job says in 10.8, uh, You formed me with your hands. You made me. The fetus is not a blob. It's not a mass. It's not a tissue. It's a person created by God in the image of God. We don't have time, but we could bring out scriptures that deal with deformity and defects in babies. In 2015, 27% of all abortions were done chemically in the first trimester, 12, 12 weeks or less. By, by the end of the first trimester, the baby is already responding to sound, recoil, recoiling from pricking, and near to sucking its thumb. All the baby's organs are present. The brain is functioning. The liver is making blood cells. The kidneys are cleaning fluids. And the baby even has fingerprints. The baby's genetic code is uniquely and unquestionably human. That same year, 73% of all abortions were done surgically. There are two types of surgical abortions. D and E, dilation and evacuation, literally cutting into pieces literally cutting into pieces and partial birth abortion rarely used but still legal where a full term baby will be delivered feet first till just the head remains in the birth canal the neck is snipped with scissors and a tube is stuck into the brain and suctioned out causing the skull to collapse in a widely publicized interview with the New York Times in 1997, Ron Fitzsimmons, the executive director of the National Coalition of Abortion Providers, estimated that in the majority of cases, the procedure is performed on a healthy mother and healthy fetus that is 20 weeks or more along in development. And now, a third procedure has been voted into law in New York and signed into law by the governor to the sound of cheers. And it's being considered in other places. That is actually having a natural childbirth and then murdering a live-born baby. New York celebrated this new law with pink lights shown all over the state. Governor Northam, a pediatric neurologist of Virginia, said the infant would be delivered, the infant would be kept comfortable, the infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and family desired, and then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. So he said, I think this was really blown out of proportion. Blown out of proportion? That the infant could be killed after birth? This new law in New York 
allows for non-physicians to perform abortions, allows for abortions up to the point of delivery, removes any protections for an infant who survives the attempted abortion, and removes any possible criminal penalties for the death of an unborn child. Partial birth abortion was attempted to be made legal in the 90s. The Republican-led Congress first passed laws banning it in December 1995 and again October 1997, but they were both vetoed by the president at the time. President Bill Clinton. He wanted partial birth, and birth abortion to stay legal. They voted to ban it again when George W. Bush was president. In the House, the final legislation was supported in 2003 by 218 Republicans and by 63 Democrats. Democrats. But it was opposed by four Republicans, 137 Democrats, and one Independent. In the Senate, the bill to ban partial birth abortion was supported by 47 Republicans and 17 Democrats, but opposed by three Republicans, 30 Democrats, and one Independent. On November 5, 2003, after being passed by both the House and the Senate, the bill to ban partial birth abortion was finally signed into law by President George W. Bush. To get around this statute, many abortion providers have adopted the practice of making sure the baby is dead before beginning the partial birth abortion. President Obama, as a state senator in Illinois, opposed the Born Alive Infants Protection Act three times and opposed a partial birth abortion bill in Illinois, even as the federal version passed the House with 282 votes, and the Senate with 64 votes, and was signed into law by President Bush in 2003. President Obama arrived in the U.S. Senate in time to denounce the Supreme Court's ruling upholding the ban. There's a huge pro-life march in Washington, D.C., every January opposing abortion. In the early, in fact, today is the 48th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, so I'm sure there's a march going on today. In the early 1990s, I went and took part in the festivities. After the last event, several of us were coming out of the building and we bumped into a teen sitting on the steps, waiting for someone with her walking braces sitting by her side. We got to chatting, and she told us her story. She's Gianna Jessen. You can Google her. She was a failed chemical abortion on April 6th, 1977, in Los Angeles, California. Her medical records indicate that she was born in the 30th week of pregnancy, to a 17-year-old girl during a failed saline abortion. Jessen's birth certificate is signed by a doctor who was performing the abortion. Jessen weighed two and a half pounds at birth, and caused by the abortion attempt, she was born with cerebral palsy, a motor condition that affects various areas of body movement. She describes it as a tremendous gift. She spent three months in the hospital before being placed in foster care. She was adopted at the age of four. She's a Christian and a pro-life activist and a very good speaker. Look her up. Researchers in Finland found a statistical relationship between abortion and suicide. They said the percentage of women who end their lives by suicide is more than three times higher for those who had an abortion than for those with no pregnancy at all, and about seven times greater than for those who were pregnant and went on to deliver their baby. A 2010 study reported in the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry said that women who had an abortion had a 98% increased risk for mental health disorders compared to women who had not had an abortion. 
The same study showed a 5% increased risk for suicidal thoughts, a 61% increased risk for mood disorders, 61% increased risk for social anxiety disorders, 261% increased risk for alcohol abuse, and 280% increased risk for non-alcohol substance abuse. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. In Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, 38% of all pregnancies end in abortion. In Massachusetts, it is illegal to ship pregnant, pregnant lobsters because you might hurt the baby lobsters. In Florida, if you kill sea turtles, you can get prison or a big fine. We've substituted light for dark and good for evil in America. In November 2018, a group of pastors got together to bless, quote-unquote bless, the opening of an abortion clinic. So we have pastors blessing the opening of an abortion clinic. Pastors are supposed to be God's representatives. What does God think about abortion? God was the author of life and has been involved in the production of life ever since. Job 33, 4 says, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Psalm 100, verse 3, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, and not we ourselves. And 127, verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Psalm 139, 13, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. And verses 15 and 16, You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And God speaking to Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 5, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb at the presence of the just-conceived Jesus. And Psalm 106, 37-40 says, they even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. Thus they were defiled by their own works and played the harlot by their own deeds. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was kindled against his people so that he abhorred his own inheritance." Here's how the message version says it. They slit the throats of their babies, murdered their infant girls and boys. The blood of their babies stained the land. Their way of life stank to high heaven. They lived like whores, and God was furious. A wildfire anger. He couldn't stand even to look at his people. He turned them over to the heathen so that the people who hated them ruled them. And in Genesis 4.10, God says to Cain, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. As a nation, we've rejected the sanctity of human life and substituted it with what we call quality of life. The Guttmacher Institute, the research arm of Planned Parenthood, says that from their research they've found the reasons women get abortions are 1% were victims of rape or incest, 12% had fetal abnormalities, 25% didn't want people to know they got pregnant, 48% said they didn't want to be a single parent or they had problems in their current relationship. 73% said they couldn't afford a child, and 74% said 
said a child would interfere with their lives. Abraham Lincoln, as he toured the battlefields of the Civil War, determined that this carnage was God's judgment for the United States being involved in slavery. Almost 1.3 million American soldiers have died in all of the nation's wars combined, and almost half of those died in the Civil War. The two crosses, I couldn't figure out how to cut a cross into pieces. So there's two crosses, but that represents 1.3 million American soldiers who have died in all the nation's wars combined. But about 62 million babies have died legally approved by the U.S. government since 1973. Reverend Franklin Graham said the biggest threat to the U.S. is that we turn our back on God. Albert Einstein said the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. And Edmund Burke, a member of the English Parliament, said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia said, God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools, and he has not been disappointed. If I have brought any message today, it is this. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. Be fools for Christ. And have the courage to suffer the contempt of the sophisticated world. If you've had an abortion, contributed to it in any way, or counseled anyone to get one, God does forgive. So what should we as Christians do? Psalm 82, 4 says, Rescue the poor and helpless. Deliver them from the grasp of evil people. Is there anyone more helpless than the baby inside the mother's womb? Proverbs 24, 11 and 12 says, Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. Don't excuse yourself by saying, Look, we didn't know. For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. He who guards your soul knows you well. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. You may not have known all of this before, but you do know now. Proverbs 31.8 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, and sure justice for those being crushed. We must pray against abortion, abortion providers, and abortion promoters, politicians or otherwise. We must pray for those who are dealing with the horror of considering abortion. It must be a heart-wrenching thought to consider killing your baby. We must pray for those who keep their baby instead of aborting it and for the organizations that help them. And we can support pro-life crisis pregnancy centers and adoption. Become politically involved. If you never considered who you vote for based on where they stand on abortion, you need to make that a priority. God will not hold us guiltless if we don't speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. When it comes to this issue, we should not be Democrat, Republican, or Libertarian. We are citizens of heaven, and we should never vote for someone who doesn't stand for the unborn. Heavenly Father, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ for every person who's ever had an abortion. I pray, Lord, that they do repent and that you bring them healing. I pray for everyone that has ever performed abortion or counsels somebody to get an abortion. I pray that you deliver them from sin and bring healing to their life. I pray for all of those that are struggling 
with the idea of possibly having a divorce and a, a, an abortion. Lord Jesus, minister to them right now. May they know your presence, your presence, real and alive in their hearts and lives and minds and bodies. Wrap your arms of love and mercy and grace around them. Hold them close and help them to make the decision to keep their child. So many, so many potentially good parents that would love to adopt a child. On the other hand, maybe you'd help them to decide to keep their child and you would give them the resources and the encouragement and the help to have that child and minister to that child and raise that child to be a God-honoring individually individual. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ for Colorado Springs Pregnancy Center and for all of the pro-life uh, organizations and work in my area and all over the world that are trying to fight against this atrocity, this evil. I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Have your own way. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. 